Okay, up to you if you're ready. Okay, let me share my screen here. Um, okay. All right. I'm Kevin Anthony. I'm with the College of the Canyons, and we're recording this for our friends in uh, Ireland, Scotland, and, and Florence. Um, and I've been working on post-pandemic tourism industry, what's going to happen with this industry. And um, I have to say that I was really uh, surprised to find so many uh, research materials that are already out there online. Uh, it's, it's almost like, uh, you know, it, it's... I was inundated. And so what I've tried to do with this is um, basically kind of shape what I see as the most important trends happening. And we can take a look at it. I would say after researching this, that the, the industry is going to change dramatically. And uh, exactly where those changes are, we're not quite sure, but we are starting to see some indications of that. So what I would like to do as, a, as an outline is, um, let me just, so I can see my picture here, is to, oops, let me go back. Okay, there we go. Uh, we're gonna look at, we gotta look at the tourism product if we, if we wanna understand that properly. And we're gonna spend a little bit of time just exactly what is it that we sell. Then we're gonna look at um, what is it that people are gonna want what are going to be the new travel preferences? And then we're going to look at some recovery systems, things that venues can do and governments and uh, also nonprofits can do to uh, reshape our industry. And then we'll have a brief slide here on some suggestions on how best to market a tourism venue after the end of this uh, pandemic. I, uh, there was a lot of studies were done. And, and I think, you know, part of it is there's no consensus a great deal what we see out there because and i think that speaks to just how big this industry is it was devastated by covid it hadn't seen anything like this in its history and uh but it also shows that changes come very quickly and as i looked at uh different um as i looked at different research material out there i found out that uh it's a very fluid situation i saw a lot of regional studies. Um, three that come to mind were a study done in Bulgaria, one done in Ecuador, and one done in Italy. And there were some amazing um, confluence, some ideas here that were found in each one of them. But I think that as you look at the studies, a lot of them are regional studies, and uh, they look just specifically to their particular area. And, uh, you know, extrapolating that into the entire international tourism community, um, it's pretty hard to do. Um, however, I say there are some consistent um, ideas. We'll I'll be pointing those out to you. What I found interesting is that the uh, research material, let's say pre-vaccine 220, 219, um, is different than the ones, than the research studies that came out in 2021. And uh, I think the big thing was happened was the vaccine came in place because before the vaccine was in place, they were looking for long-term recoveries, two to five years. After the vaccine started to come in, then the, there was a real different uh, tone to the research in that it is going to be, um, it's going to be a lot quicker. Uh, there's going to be a, a lot of um, um, people are going to want to get out and they're going to want to travel more. But I think the, the big break point there was, you know, the two, 2019, 2020, we weren't quite sure if the vaccine would get out there. We weren't quite sure how far it would go. Now that we've seen that it's getting out there, and we're seeing, you'll see some of our, uh, I did some looking, the vaccination rates are really quite high in Europe. They're like 93, 94%. And uh, that accelerated vaccination rate is going to accelerate the recovery of the tourism industry where pre-vaccine was saying two to five years um, post-vaccine or vaccine, it, we're gonna see that happen in some areas 
uh, a lot quicker. Now, of course, that is probably your more industrial states are going to see things happen quicker than some of your uh, places that don't have vaccination rates. So I think that's the driving thing is, is the vaccinations is uh, changing it. Um, but there's a wide, wide range of findings on different things. Um, and I'm going to try to focus on what is, seems to be the most common. Uh, I think that a lot of um, the, the tourism market basically is uh, domestic tourism. In other words, Americans stay in America, Italians stay in America. That's, that's the bulk of your tourism dollars are in country. Uh, but we're going to look at the international tourism because that's kind of the big buck. Uh, that, that there's that, that's a, a substantial area and that's kind of like um, the area you'd like to see come back real quickly. And as I mentioned earlier, the projected return in the pre-2019 uh, was two to five years. It gets accelerated in um, 2021. Um, and that, that ties to our vaccine. Now, what's really important when we look at the tourism industry is that um, it's not what we want to sell. And I know my students have heard me say this a lot. Uh, it's not what we want to sell. It's what people want to buy. It's what does the tourism want to buy? And uh, they have basically these preconceived perceptions of the results of the, the trip. Um, and what they want to buy is changing. Uh, if people that have restaurants understand this because the tastes change and there's always kind of like something new that people want to try, especially here in Los Angeles. But it, we, we've got to focus focus not on so much what we want to present, but it is what is the tourist, what is that tourist going to want to purchase? And uh, that's going to be the driving focus of, of what I'm going to share with you here today. Um, now, a couple of things we're going to look at, pre-pandemic preconceived perceptions, what people look for was obviously the monetary total dollar cost of the excursion. Uh, another cost that we don't spend a lot of time with, and I'm gonna talk about today is to access the product itself. Um, there are places where people will go to, um, I, I think of the Colosseum in, in Rome, um, people have to stand two to three hours outside the Colosseum to, um, to, before they can get into it. And uh, that's a cost, that's a lost time, it's a service failure that has to be addressed okay the big thing with tourism products is the experience it creates and that experience creates a memory that seems to be in the past but it's it seems to be uh people want different memories i think that the idea of people going to rome and sitting in um, a five-star hotel and eating in a five-star restaurant and then um walking around the, the city um it's not much of a bang for your buck tourism experience because you can get that back home. And uh, it is kind of like, um, but the idea that it really drives our tourism industry is what memories we create. And what we're seeing on that, that particular area we're gonna look at is adventure tourism is becoming a lot more popular, especially in the pre-pandemic area because there's not as much contact with people and uh, it creates a much more, um, um, experience a much different experience than people have at home. And, and that's my favorite. I do a lot of adventure tourism. Uh, the other thing is education. You know, some of the educational opportunities that people will get in travel that creates an experience, whether it's a cooking class or a wine tasting class or some type of immersion into, um, you know, that. So these all go into that beginning phase as to what people are going to um, want when they come to. Uh, uh, when they make a decision on where to go to. Uh, the infrastructure, accessibility to the product has always been an issue. Um, we're seeing more infrastructure. Um, there, there's a lot more ability to access products now um, as far as uh, just the infrastructure, especially in your third world countries, but that's been part of the, people don't want to spend a lot of time, um, you know, getting to the destination is one thing. I'll give you an example. We find that Japanese tourists will opt to come to Los Angeles as opposed to New York because they can get here quicker, and they save you know three to five hours on the uh, to, for, instead of flying to New York, they fly to Los Angeles to get three to five hours of travel time saving 
uh, their vacation time getting here and they can actually stay three to five hours longer. I mean, that's, and so the Japanese would opt for Los Angeles over that because of the accessibility of the product. Um, and services, accommodations and food beverage, you know, what, what exactly are those, what are those experiences are going to be? So these are some of the ideas. These are, you know, when you put that stew of different decision-making into where you want to go, these are some of the areas you look at. Um, and of course, uh, when we look at, uh, we're going to break these items down, the cost perception, of course, the actual cost, the transportation cost is big to the venue. How much is that going to cost? Um, housing. And it's interesting because Airbnb is becoming a lot, is becoming more popular in, uh, throughout the world. And that is cutting some of the cost with that. And uh, <clears throat> one of the things that I, I just mentioned that I wanted to spend some time with is that managing the weight. Uh, people that have been isolated, that have been in the pandemic, and even before that, uh, that I think the pandemic has accented the fact that people don't want to wait. And when they have their valuable, precious tourism time, they don't want to be standing in a line. Uh, because that, that, that wasted time is a service failure. And that really affects the overall experience and thought of, of uh, and memory of, of what the experience is going to be like. So there are some strategies here that I want to put forward for people to think of, for tourism venues to think about later on in the presentation on how we can minimize that. Uh, it's very important. We're kind of Los Angeles. There's a, we have a, we have a restaurant that is not a restaurant. I'm sorry. It's a hotel. It's in Las Vegas. And, uh, you know, and, it gets inundated on a Friday because everybody's coming there. It's the Mirage Hotel. And behind the Mirage Hotel's front desk is they've got a, a fish aquarium. And it's a very narrow fish aquarium, but that entire back wall is a fish aquarium. And as people are waiting in line, they watch the fish go by. And that's managing the wait because it is giving them, uh, they're getting some value out of that experience of waiting. And I think that we're going to look at managing the weight is uh, we have to come up with strategies to engage the tourists so that we don't have any um, uh, lost costs, basically, in time. Now, as I go forward, if anybody has a question, please stop me. I'd be more than happy to. We're going to have questions and answers at the end. But if you've got a question, you can stop me, and I'll be more than happy to, uh, to address it at this point. And just really, I can't see you, so you just have to kind of shout out, okay? Um, now, I think the big thing that uh, the pre-pandemic experience is the memory that it creates. And I think that is uh, understanding that memory. That's what people talk about is, and that comes from the experience. And I think that that is a very big part of the Disney phenomenon, uh, especially Disneyland and Disney's, Disney World, but not Disney Paris. And part of that is as premier tourism venues, People in Los Angeles and Florida, they grew in the United States, they grew up with Disneyland. And they know it like the back of their hand. They know what the rides are. They, so why do they go back? Well, it, it reconnects them with the memory of past experience there. We see that in the Disney Paris operation. Uh, we, they don't have those memories of growing up with the Disney Paris operation. And so I think that that's a big, um, what, I think that's one of the reasons Disney Paris kind of isn't as popular is because the people that are going to Disneyland now, they know it, they've been there, they've had that. And, but they can remember going there when they were younger and remember going with family members and they can get that, that experience, okay? I think the, the big thing that I also wanted to note here is that one of the premier successes for this, and it goes back to our initial uh, point that I wanted to make is getting the opinion of visitors. Walt Disney, the, the founder of that, greet guests at the exit to see what they liked, what they enjoyed. And he would make changes in Disneyland off of what their comments. He would also, um, he'd sit there in Disneyland. He had a balcony. He had two apartments in Disney. And he had an apartment that was over uh, Tom Sawyer's Island. And he would sit back there and sit in that chair and just watch people's reactions. What do they like? What do people want? And that is something that is, um, I think that's a constant uh, in tourist product, product offerings is constantly trying to find out what, are, what is it that people want? What is it that, 
what excites him. And uh, that was why he, I think this, one of the reasons Disney was so successful is that he was able to continually go into looking at why people would enjoy what they were enjoying. And I mention that now because I want to bring us back to that. That's the most constant thing in the tourism industry is determining what people want. And uh, people's wants have changed. And I think that that's, um, that's, that's interesting because we find out that, uh, you know, we've all been through a very difficult time of, of isolation of, um, we've, and I, I see this from my, my students and some of the reflections in papers they write that uh, things have changed and people want different, people have a different uh, appetite for uh, travel and what we have that. Now, um, one of the things I think that has changed is that, and this was there before, but I think it's gonna get more of an emphasis, it seems to in the research is that people are going to wanna to be more cultural, they want more cultural immersion. Um, I think that the, the, the cooking classes, the wine tasting classes, the uh, regional, uh, People more apt, I think, to look at a Tuscany vacation and uh, than they are in, in Rome. I think that they want to get that immersion into the culture. Uh, another area that I'm very, um, that I like is adventure trekking. You know, uh, I've been to Machu Picchu, Kilimanjaro, and these are uh, very enriched experiences, uh, especially for uh, people that have got the legs, can do the hiking. Last summer, I went to, uh, I went to uh, France and, uh, you know, looking at that decision, it was, well, I'm really not going to be in very much contact. I'll wear a mask on the plane. And uh, we're going to basically, my son and I, we basically are going to be walking through the, the Alps. We're not going to see very many people. And we were able to do it safely and um, had just a marvelous experience uh, at the different bed and breakfasts and, and walking. I think adventure trekking is um, is an area that is going to get a lot bigger, and I think that uh, it's and it's a lot less expensive, and uh, so that's one of the um, decision makers for people that want to take trips. The other one is infrastructure. Some people like the urban shopping museums in the city, that location. I think that is, that's been a constant, that's gonna to continue to be there. People still gonna to wanna to go into the Uffizi Gallery in Florence and, and wanna see, uh, engage with some of the art there or seeing the David at the Academia. Uh, services, customer service is important. There are some cultures that customer service is, um, is, is problematic, let me put it that way, and I'm not, uh, and I've not really had many bad experiences in, in customer service. Um, I, in, in, I've been to a lot of different countries, but there are places that customer service does become an issue that will that um, will shy people away from, or people are not attracted to it because of the the interaction they're going to get as a customer service. Um, safety and security has been and will continue to be a, of of concern. And uh, recommend, you know, anybody in America or, you know, any place, wherever you're going to, if you want to get a sense of the safety and security of a particular area, you go to the United States Department of State and go under the travel advisories. And they will tell you, they get reports filed on a regular basis, and they will tell you where the pickpockets are, they'll tell you uh, some of the different scams that people operate on for us, and uh, wherever you're you're coming from that that becomes um you know uh an item for people to conser be concerned i mean i've been to places where you go into the hotel and there's a 16 foot chain link fence with bob wire around the top of it and, you know the security is not uh, not the best there um the current status may change quickly depending on COVID mutations. And that's one of the things that I think is gonna drive the changes in our industry. Uh, I don't know if you've been watching, but in China, Shanghai, they have some draconian measures in place now. They have quarantine centers. If a person is test positive for COVID on your floor, the entire floor in that apartment goes to a quarantine center, even if they're not found to be 
um, even if they're found to not to have the, the virus, they're being taken there. Uh, the, the, the lockdown that's going on in Shanghai, there's just no end in sight. And uh, it's, a, it's not a democracy, it's an autocracy. And so they can just basically say, you're all gonna stay home. And people have trouble getting food. They have trouble, you know, they're, they're locked up in, in their apartments. They're not allowed out on the streets. Um, and I think that as we go forward, as the industry goes forward, I think that this is still that unknown factor that's out there. What problematic, um, and this was just recently in our paper here in Los Angeles, is that the United States predicts maybe 100 million new cases in the fall of COVID. So it's still out there. It's still, in many ways, it's still going to drive our industry um, if we have a, a large outbreak or something that is, um, because this is a particularly problematic uh, virus and it continues to mutate, it continues to change, you know, that's part of it. I don't know if people realize this, but the, the pandemic of the Spanish flu of 1918, which was a very before vaccinations, um, I think it killed 600,000 Americans, killed 30 million people worldwide, the flu. And, uh, but the last recorded case was 1938 that basically they were still getting people with the Spanish flu 20 years after the, the big, big pandemic. Now it mutated, it probably wasn't as lethal as it was in that first year, um, but still it's out there. I mentioned this because all that we're talking about here today can be changed if, um, can be changed by the COVID outbreak, okay? Now, I also found it interesting in looking at things, um, most of the major European countries have fully vaccinated at over 90% of their population. This is a big, um, this is a big, big deal because if you've got, Italy has an 87% vaccination rate, uh, Ireland 93.5, England 93%. And here we've got the United States back at 67 fully vaccinated. So we're only two thirds. We are way behind. That's going to affect our domestic, uh, tourism. The thing that I find so frustrating with that is that a lot of the disinformation um, that was put out about the vaccine has, um, it has hurt our economy. We still recently, as last week, we were losing 350 people a day from COVID. And they're, you know, the vast majority of those, I'm sure, are unvaccinated. Or, and uh, the disinformation that was put out there from a lot of different places. Uh, I have no doubt that the, there were foreign players in this that were putting disinformation out, but we're looking at 67% fully vaccinated. It's very low. It's a thir only two thirds. When everybody else is at 95, 90, almost 100%, people are going to opt to go to places where the vaccination rate is higher because the incident is going to be a lot lower. Any questions or thoughts on that? Now, after the isolation among other pandemic experience, have, have tourists desired some new wants? I think they have. I think that there's, um, I, think people, I think the isolation has created a time of introspection um, when people are considering changing their wants. I, I think that if, it, if the pandemic hadn't come along, a lot of people probably just stayed in their same um, thinking patterns. But I think that is, um, I think that's a big, big, big part of it. As I mentioned earlier, the recovery is going to be in regions, you know, where you see a high vaccination rate, you're going to see a lot more ro robust recovery. Domestic tr uh, tourism is going to take precedent over that. I don't think you're going to have um, a linear uh, recovery. I think it's going to kind of come in bumps up and down and up and down. If we're looking in America of 100 million new uh, outbreaks in the fall, and we only have a 67% vaccination rate. Yeah, we're going to have some, we're, we're going to lag behind. And I think that, I think that what we've got here is, uh, and just think to yourself, um, if you, if you just will just um, think to yourself, uh, how have your perspectives changed? You know, what, what, what is, what are your thoughts? And I know that from my students and getting their reflection papers, um, they have changed. I think that you know they've there's uh, 
I think even change to the, even to the value system of what they find important. I think that's that's important for us to look at. Um, let me move this down again. Oops. There we go. Okay. Um, I think that the long haul travel is going to come back. Uh, again, like we said, 2019 put it further out, but now with the vaccine, vaccination rates being much higher, uh, they expect that to come in a lot quicker. Or when they were saying a two to five year recovery in some areas are looking at less than three. One of the findings that was consistent in a lot of the regional um, studies is that people are gonna wanna uh, have more together time. They're gonna reconnect with friends and families. And that's gonna be one of the main reasons for travel is to uh, reconnect with people because they've been isolated for so long. Domestic tourism is the premier tourism market segment. Uh, the international market is, uh, it's substantial, but it's not the, most of the tourism is done internally. And one of the things that, uh, you know, to travel in your own country, you can go by car, uh, you're, you're not on trains or planes and you can uh, just stay with your family group and go visit family. Adventure travel, a, a number of the uh, articles said that this is gonna be a big deal because it offers, you know, um, you're somewhat isolated. You're not really coming in contact with a lot of people. Uh, it's not as expensive. Um, you know, people are more apt to, to go into uh, a, a tourism experience that is once in a lifetime. I've had a couple of those once in a lifetime. So they said, you know, um, I've hiked uh, into uh, Machu Picchu down in Peru and I've hiked uh, the Alps. I've hiked uh, you know, the Andes a couple of times, uh, Kilimanjaro, and those are uh, not expensive trips, and, uh, but you get a real enrichment and feeling towards, uh, towards a, that memory. Um, <clears throat> it's gonna be interesting. A lot of the, um, a couple of the research articles said that the leisure segment's gonna return before business. And I would have thought, you know, business would be the first to go back in. I think what's happening, and this may be a long-term change with uh, the tourism activity, is that uh, the Zoom, what we're working with now, is really connecting people up, and it it, um, it minimizes the need to travel. And what we're going to see off of that, and I saw this in a couple of other of the of the articles, was that we're going to see work play, and that's going to be a new trend that says many travelers are gonna use the freedom of remote working to work and travel at the same time. Um, you know, you can teach the class Zoom, I can teach this class, uh, well, you know, right, what we're doing now, this class is, is being available to people in, in Europe and it's also available to us here. Uh, I think that that work play, uh, people are gonna say, yeah, I'm gonna work by Zoom um, in Florence, Italy next year for three months, and then I'm gonna to go to Ireland for three months. All this is uh, are gonna be a new change. And I got that off of, I thought that was a fascinating uh, determination. Um, <clears throat> now, there are many studies on post-pandemic tourism and many regional studies. I think the studies uh, really from 2020 are almost outdated at this point. Um, and some of the more travel summaries that uh, preferences I want to summarize are that, um, and I found this in a couple of them is called smart care. And that means that people will have more access to technology. For example, um, we are going to be um, using our phones to, uh, you know, we're in such an information rich environment that we live in now. Our phones, we have, and I've heard this, I've yet to use it though, that I can speak something in English into my phone and it will tell me what to say in Italian. Or someone say something in Italian and uh, it'll be translated into uh, English. That's one. Uh, access to when people, when we talk about managing the weight, and this is an area that I really would think tourism venues have to think about. When people are waiting in line there, if they've got their little phone there that has got an app that is going to explain 
the history or the art or uh, while they're waiting in line, that enriches their entire experience. So smart care technology access. Now smart care is not just for tourism. Uh, it's, it's a term that's used, you know, uh, it basically means a data rich environment. And I think that uh, hospitals use it. And I think that, that that's gonna be, uh, that's a big change. Uh, for example, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, later on, but basically the idea being, hey, uh, this is my choices. I can go to the Coliseum and wait two hours. I can go to St. Peter's and wait 20 minutes. I can go to, um, you know, you can look at some of the different museums there in Rome and you can get a sense of how long. Um, well, I'm talking about that a little bit, but I think that that's one of the applications that we can use for that. Uh, pricing strategies, I think bundling is always uh, a good idea. It is, the idea is, you know, get the tourists into your country. And once they get into your country, they're going to spend money. And if you can give them, uh, you can bundle up something where you, you know, you the bundling of the flight and hotels is a good thing. The bundling of um, hotels and uh, breakfast or, or venues, things like that. All of that's going to be more popular. Um, we, we see that safety is a concern. And, and one of the reports have put out there that that is one of the reasons that's fueling the domestic tourism market. That, that's probably true. Um, private cars over trains and planes in all three studies, Italy, Ecuador, and Bulgaria, those are the regional studies I spent the most time with. They all said the same thing. It's private cars, domestic travel over uh, planes. Uh, comfort, that's always an issue. There's a certain level of comfort people want. It doesn't have to be extravagant, but it still is something that is clean and safe. Uh, it's important. Now, social distancing, I saw that in a number of research articles, but those were kind of from like 219 before the vaccination got up there. Uh, places are considered safer and suggest that the <clears throat> psychological risk connected with travel affects consumers attitudes and intentions in the tourism business. Okay. Now that is in the report, basically that, you know, people are going to want to socially distance. So I want to check that out. So I went on the webcam to look at the Trevi fountain. It's jammed, <laughs> you know? So this report from 2019, um, there's no social distancing at the Trevi fountain. Vaccination rate is high. Uh, people are uh, shoulder to shoulder. They're at the Trevi fountain. Like it, just about, I've seen it more crowded than that, but it was still very crowded. Um, and I'm sensing that that particular uh, study was done pre-vaccination. Now, without the vaccination, I don't think social distancing is as much of a concern as it was. Um, <clears throat> and this whole idea that they wanted less inner human contact. Um, and I think that that's where that gives rise to the natural environment and the adventure tourism that we've spoken about. Okay, if you've got a question, you can put it in the chat. Okay, let's do that. Now, this is an interesting thing I found in the research is sustainability. The pandemic has also accelerated the interest in sustainability issues. And the need for sustainable practice was already getting highlighted pre-COVID-19, but it's now in sharper focus. focus. For example, there's been a rediscover of local travel options as a possibility. Uh, there is a report suggested sustainability will be key to the recovery. Now, <clears throat> that is problematic, and I'll say why. I think that is being fueled by the National Geographic reports. National Geographic has put out a report there that really highlights the importance of sustainability and its growth. They've been doing that forever. And I think that that is, and this is, they, they put the drive out there to we want more sustainable activities. Um, and they actually say, for example, many tourists are not willing to pay extras for envi environmental issues without having additional personal benefits. I think that's true. I don't think people are ready to spend more money for sustainability. However, I think there are practices that people are more uh, willing to um, to adopt when they travel that uh, promote sustainability. For example, in a hotel, um, it's when you think of the energy and uh, to clean sheets, it, you know, 
I think that there's going to be a thing where seats, sheets for a long-term stay would be changed every three or four days, not every day, like is accustomed to some place. I think there's some of those uh, changes. That's a huge, that's a big step in sustainability. Um, we have some, you know, just some things that, you know, uh, energy saving devices we can use in hotels that are not expensive. I think in that area, I think sustainability is going to have an impact. But I don't think, as I was mentioned here, people are ready to pay more for sustainability. They're, they're more apt to um, adopt practices for sustainability. Um, <clears throat> Now, some post-pandemic travel preferences, of course, um, the attributes, including risk-associated elements, that, that's always part of the area there. And I direct you again to the Department of State um, uh, travel advisories, because as, as I've said, um, like Italy, normally Italy is, they have four levels, one, two, three, and four. Um, one is everything is green light. Two is kind of a yellow light. And Italy's had a yellow light for, um, I was looking at this last night, and for terrorism, which is to me is surprising. The Italians have had very little terrorist activities because they are very well, uh, they've got a very uh, robust uh, uh, police policing of that. Um, <clears throat> but it does, it is going to be part of selection process. That has been pre-COVID, but it's also gonna be after COVID. Um, <clears throat> Also, we found out that low-income people were highly influenced by factors of accessibility and discounts. And I think the thing that is, uh, when we talk about a low-income person or the youth, they're not as uh, turned off towards travel um, as the older generation because they don't really see the vaccine, and they really see the COVID as affecting them as much so as it does uh, an older person. Last but not least, we have seen that safety and hygiene have become key factors to select destination and tourism activities. This is, I, I think, has more emphasis now. Um, <clears throat> I think that it basically is, um, you know, um, <clears throat> I think that uh, hygiene has become an important area as far as uh, making the decision as to where to visit. Um, Tourist destination businesses should prioritize younger travelers who seem to be less fr least frightened by, of the virus, as I mentioned that earlier. Um, <clears throat> the travel industry is going to change. And I think this is was coming about, but I think it's going to be accelerated. The customer ratings are going to outweigh personal consultations. I think that people now it's going to be, they're going to go onto the Yelps and the travel advisories that are online. And they're going to see what did people, what were people's experience here? That's going to be accented more. Um, and I saw that in a couple of the research papers. Um, one of the things I did not find in the research papers, but I know from my experience here is finding the workers. I think the tourism industry is going to be, um, is going to, have, especially in the United States, the tourism industry is uh, going to take a big hit because they can't find the workers with the hospitality attitude. Um, tourists are going to be more deliberate in their decisions. Um, I think that's because they're, they're more experienced traveling. And I think that they're going to be, um, they're going to be weighing values of different, all of these different items that come into a tourism decision. I think they're going to um, pay close attention, attention to that. Experience will drive more decisions, seeking different cultural experiences, the cooking classes and wine tastings. I've mentioned that already. Okay, one of the areas I want to talk about real quick, and I just kind of put this in, is I sense that there's going to be a rise in dark tourism. Now, dark tourism, of course, obviously is, if you've been to a concentration camp, that's clearly a dark tourism thing. But we have a couple of examples here that are, um, and I'm going to talk about the last one first, and that's the Chicago Public Library that I was in Chicago two weeks ago and I went to visit. And uh, here's this wonderful building that they have, um, that was gonna be just demolished, but it had some terrific uh, mosaics in it. It had a, a glass dome that had been done by Tiffany. 
120 years ago, something like that. It had some really ornate, it was just a beautiful building on the inside. And, uh, but in the dark tourism area, the guy that was running the tour talked about, he said, you know, it's an old building, so we brought a ghost hunter in. And the ghost hunter said, yeah, there's a young man standing over there. He's very sad. And we walked him to the building and he came down to another room where we'd had a, um, he said there were a lot of people in that room. And this was a, a room that commemorated uh, veterans of the Civil War. So then he went and got a second ghost hunter who did not know the first ghost ghost hunter, did not know what he had said, didn't know he'd even been there, came up with the same thing. He said, yeah, there's in this one part of the building, there's a sad man standing there. I mean, this gives me chills when I think about this ghost story. And he goes down the room, he says, yeah, there's a lot of people in this room. So having two said it, they said, well, let's just be sure they had a third one, same results. And they figured the man that, the sad man sitting in the corner is standing outside an office, that uh, he was the builder of it who got fired. And uh, he, uh, they say, died of a broken heart soon after that. But I think there's an element of that that finds people are interested. And it's not new. Um, in Pompeii, in southern Italy, uh, Mark Twain, the great, probably the greatest American novelist, had visited that. And on his way from leaving from Pompeii, he writes a reflection on that experience. And there's a sadness to it. And uh, there's an experience that he got of that, that sadness of visiting Pompeii. Uh, the Colosseum, and I got this from one of my students. I was giving a tour of it one day and we had a study abroad in Rome. And one of my students came up and she was kind of off to the side. She wasn't really appreciating the, the tour. I asked her what's wrong. She said, you know, professor, a lot of terrible things happened here. You know, and I hadn't, I lost that focus. Yeah, there is, there is something to that. Um, there is an element in the experience that dark tourism is going to attract. And the, one of my favorite places here, we, in California, we have a ghost town. And by a ghost town, it was built during the gold rush. And it was, it was pretty high up and everything was just kind of left there. Well, I shouldn't say everything. Only about 10% of the town was left there. But it's substantial. There's a lot of buildings up there. And you can actually go in and you can see what people were living how they were liking, uh, what their lives were like and, and get in touch with that. And they have a boot hill and they've got, you know, you look at all of our Western ghost towns, they all have a boot hill. That's all part of dark tourism. And that has an appeal. And I think that that's uh, part of, um, that's gonna be part of the decision-making process. Um, there'll be a different shaping of tourism venues. And uh, we talked about the weight engagement standards, bundling of products. We talked about that, the smart care, more technology access, the language and venues. We're also going to see more disabled access venues. The disabled have an extraordinary amount of um, disposable income. Uh, the cruise ships have learned this and they have made their cruise liners uh, access for the disabled, they, they provided ramps and things like that for access. And uh, and they did it because there was a lot of money. We'll see that in our new tourism venues. Um, but moving forward, the industry is gonna change and the questions, the thoughts that I want to share with you basically are that um, I think the really most successful tourism venues are gonna be partnerships of government the nonprofit convention services and the venues themselves. And they're going to accelerate these changes. And they need to be close. The, the regions that uh, pull in together these, they all have a part of, part of the, uh, the share of this. You know, that tourism product is an export. It brings money into your community. And they all have a stake in this. The governments do, the convention services, and the venue itself. And the venue includes the hotels and restaurants. And I think the most robust, um, effective tourism venues are going to be those that create partnerships. Government interventions provide tax cuts to your, you know, it's, you're attracting money into your community. Don't tax it away. We have some of that. That is just in some of our cities here in the United States. They charge such high taxes and things that they chase business away. I think incentives uh, maybe are important. You can reduce prices, uh, uh, go for younger tourists, uh, things of that. Government can do those interventions. 
Uh, they can subsidize transportation costs. I think that's a, a real possibility. You can give rebates to travelers for, uh, in some of these places they do that already. You can get uh, a rebate for taxes. That you, um, but even more than that, I mean, if you've got a, uh, a $20 um, souvenir that you purchase and the government gives you back $5 on that, that's a huge savings for the, the traveler. It's something that gets noticed and you're generating more income because what happens, they take that extra $5 and buy something else. That's the government intervention I think is important. Nonprofits supported by local tax revenues, uh, they can do better marketing, marketing the venue better. Um, they can create and maintain those channels in social media, uh, the promoting regions. These are what they're charged with doing now, but they have to be more robust with it. I think one of the things the nonprofits can do is to attract off-season tourists. Everybody goes, everybody thinks, oh, I'll go to Italy in uh, June, July, August. It's hot there. You know, the off seasons, the Septembers, Octobers, the March, Aprils, those are nice times to visit. Even in the, it's not that, even in um, wintertime, it is um, without crowds, but supporting those off season um, tourists. Um, those off-season periods is important. And then finally, monitor your customer ratings. As we mentioned earlier, the industry is gonna be driven by people that are um, gonna be driven by um, the, the, the comments that you find in the travel, uh, your social medias, your Yelps, your travel advisories, monitoring those, checking those, making sure that you have, because that's gonna drive your marketing. We'll look at that in a second. Some other things that venues can do, uh, they can manage the engagement of the tourists better. And it, we get back to one of the things I talked about is engagement during the wait. When people are waiting two or three hours to get into a venue, there has to be either an app that, that tells them about the venue or there has to be some type of interaction where you have to get people to come at a different time. I mean, I think the Coliseum opens up at, at eight, open it up at 6.30. You know, spread the crowd out. Don't just have one entry, have four or five entries. Um, and it's big enough to take, you know, thousands of people in that. Uh, being more flexible with that is, is important because you want to drive those personal comments of those experiences. You don't want to have someone say, oh, the Coliseum, I had to wait two hours to get in there. That turns off, you're going to lose, lose people with that. Uh, one of the things that Disney does that I think is an applicable situation is they have the fast pass. In other words, you go one place and you know if you come back in 35 minutes, you go right to the front of the line. Uh, I think what's important, and I use Rome because I've, I've visited many times, is, is to, you know, the wait time here at the Coliseum is two hours. The wait time here at St. Peter's is 15 minutes. Well, we can start to maneuver people around uh, easier. Say, well, we'll go to St. Peter's now and we'll see what the wait time is a little later at the Coliseum and, you know, in those areas. And uh, then creating good customer service in your employees. Given in America, we have a real crunch here. I don't know to what extent it's gonna affect uh, Europe. We don't have good, we don't have enough employees. And being able to create that good customer service in your employees. Um, I think Europe does a better job with that, but I think that's one of the focuses that the venues have to really pay attention to is make sure that you've got good customer service. We said customer ratings are going to dominate the market. Uh, when we talk about the marketing aspect, it's going to be dominated by what people write about in their blogs and in their uh, in their comments. You want to make sure those are good. We'll see family and wealthy are considered to be the prime drivers, and that's not new. Um, less congested venues, off-season availability. That's one of the things that you can we can market to. I would market more open spaces. I would market more adventure tourism opportunities. And one of the things that came up in a couple of the uh, researches is um, takeout options for food, not just having sit down restaurants. We're used to that in America here, but I think that uh, that's a possibility that people say, well, I don't have to go into the restaurant and you know sit with a lot of people. Um, that's a possibility as well. Okay, thank you very much. That, that wraps up what I have to say. Let me stop my share here. And uh, let me see, do we have any questions or thoughts? Anybody? Anybody, any, uh, 
any questions of what we talked about there? I really enjoyed doing this, putting this together because it's, it's really, I, I didn't think there would be a lot of information out there. It was just, there was so much. It was about sorting through that and being able to come up with some real world, uh, some real world thoughts. You know, for myself, uh, I'm really seriously, I'm going to do something this summer, probably um, go back to the Alps and do a hike there. I, I'm actually, I've talked to a, a couple of friends to go with me. And I think that that is, um, you know, I can, I can do that. Um, any questions or comments? Anybody, uh, anybody surprised by anything that they saw in this um, presentation? I think one big thing, Professor, that you pointed out was, you know, the impact of that COVID had on different tourist areas. And now, you know, we're finally trying to get back to the norm and have people come and you know right. enjoy enjoy their time so it's really yeah, I, good stuff i wish i had a better sense of where the industry is going to be you know i, I just don't because yeah, there's a yeah, lot of moving parts know. right now and uh it is there's a lot of moving parts dominique you got a question well it's more of like a thought and an observation Sure. You mentioned adventure tourism, which is something that I like a lot and local tourism as well. And I find that in California, we can do that more often because we're surrounded by very different types of environments and habitats. Sure. But, but the earth is dying. Indigenous people have been fighting to keep this earth sustainable for the longest time. So sure. my concern is that people aren't going to be vaccinated or conscious of that and they're going to put themselves in these environments where they're going to make other people sick oh such as yeah. like travel to um the amazon or to um central america mexico everywhere from the top of north america to all the way to the bottom of south america it's a sure. concern it is and i think that that's um you know, there are that, that that's one of the effects. You're right. I think that that's that's something that's going to be uh, that needs to be be thought of. Um, it's amazing. Um, I was reading something this morning about Mount Everest and uh, they have these microplastics in the in the snow. Where are they getting that? Well, they're getting that from the dress people wear up there, the nylons. They lose. Uh, they notice that in those camp areas there, the nylon is the plastic and that is getting into the, the snow and that plastic gets into the water, you know, it just, so yeah, su sustainability, our, our planet really needs to, it's got to be the thinking of people that are change, you know. Um, and I feel like um, during the pandemic, we didn't mm -hmm. go out traveling, so that really helped the environment recover a little bit, but yeah mass traveling through airplanes, through boats, and all the emissions of carbon, we need to find a better solution at that. Uh, absolutely. 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 You know, and it's, um, I got to tell you, you know, I, when I was climbing on Mount Kilimanjaro, you know, I was up at 18,000 feet. More than that, I was close to 19,000 feet. And uh, what happened up there is that it's ice, but the ice kept the rocks in place, it was like a concrete. Well, when the day that I was up there, it was at eight o'clock in the morning. And uh, with, I was with, with another hiker and a couple of porters and we're walking along a trail, the trail just gave way. And one of the persons almost lost their life. She was saved, but, but the, you know, what, what has happened is that loose rock up there because of global warming, no longer supported that trail. And now they've closed that. You can't go up that way anymore. But that's a direct result of global warming. And the person, my, one of the climbers, one of my fellow climbers that almost lost their life, it would have been because of global warming. Because it was a perfectly nice trail. I mean, it was, you know, a couple of feet wide. It was just right along the thing. But all of a sudden, boom, that whole thing just gave way. And uh, it was because, you know, it didn't have, the, didn't have the ice to hold it up there. So it was the most terrifying 30 seconds of my life, but 
you know, I was on the side of this mountain and the trail in front of me gave way. And it's like the trail below me is going to give way. I had to run away to get out of it. So great. Well, it's 10 o'clock here. And what I would like, uh, I appreciate, um, you know, Maritza, if you could get me on uh, the recording, there are some of my students I'm going to share this with. And uh, I'd appreciate that. And uh, what I'm going to do now is uh, I've got my law class that is going to go into there. I'll open up the Zoom in my law class, Canvas Shell, and we're going to convene in a couple minutes here. We're going to pick up our lesson from there. Okay. okay. Thank you. That was great. I was actually, uh, you mentioned Disney that a couple times, and I was like, oh, that's, I'm a Disney fan. So I used to live next to Universal, but I never wanted to go. And yet I go to Disneyland, which is farther. And I would say experience wise, even the, their parking structure, once when you once when you drive in, you guided right into the parking spot. And that already makes you one less position, one good thing that already happened to get you started into the park. So I think your your thoughts on um the experience is definitely uh, something yeah. we'll have to look into or look look to see how it's changing the industry. I I, I <laughs> I no, I've actually taken students on a tour of Disneyland to talk about that experience and all the different, I mean, he, some of the things that Disney thought about were so far ahead of its time. I mean, in many ways, he's still running that park because of this, the service delivery system he put together for that. So, yeah, uh, I, I, before the price got up to 150 bucks a person, I used to be able to take the students there, but it's just too expensive. So. <laughs> yeah. Great, everybody. Okay, I will see you in my law class.